series. Uh, we have Tom Perry. Uh, Tom is a native of Patrick County, a graduate of Virginia Tech, and has written numerous books uh, on the local community and history. He's been here, I think this is the fourth time he's been here. Uh, I've read about Gettysburg and Chancellorsville, and I've heard a lot about the Battle of Martinsville and uh, William Palmer, but we're going to hear about it today. So glad you're here. and. Uh, we lost Mary Jordan. <laughs> it's good to see everybody. Uh, the same old crowd, a lot of you, and some new ones in here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Battle of Martinsville. Uh, I don't know if it's really a battle, it's more like a skirmish in Martinsville, but uh, we've got to we've got elevate ourselves, so we're going to call it the Battle of Martinsville. Uh, this is my book, which is about William Palmer, who was the commander of the Union forces. Uh, this book is uh, uh, actually kind of a favorite project of mine. It's uh, dedicated to our buddy Debbie Hall sitting right there because she uh, edits a lot of my books. And uh, he's my favorite Yankee, so uh, I, for a William and Mary graduate, that's probably an insult. But, uh, she's, she's already talking trash to me about the football game in August, so you better watch her. Uh, got a new book out uh, about the old Dinky Railroad that ran from Mount Airy, North Carolina, to Kibler Valley. Uh, if you're really desperate for something to do this evening, I'm going to be on Fox 8 at 5 o'clock on Roy's folks talking about this. I know everybody will run home now and set their DVR so they can watch that. But Roy's folks is great because if you ever are on there, you get to go to their big holiday show in the fall and sell books. So that was my main reason for trying to get on Roy's folks. But that's going to be today uh, at 5 o'clock. We've got another book coming out here hopefully soon. And uh, it's about my buddy David Mender sitting right there. And it's about his uh, family, uh, a lot about his father who was a D-Day, and uh, his family's military service to this country. And I've uh, been working on this a while, so we hope to have this out this summer. And uh, y'all can ask David about it if you're interested. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, William Palmer and Martinsville here. As soon as I figure out how to operate Steve's uh, oops, machine. In the spring of 1865, the Confederacy is shrinking. Uh, William Sherman is marching up through uh, South Carolina into North Carolina. Robert E. Lee, of course, is being uh, held at bay by U.S. Grant around Richmond. And George Stoneman is going to set off from Knoxville, Tennessee on a raid that's going to bring him uh, into our part of the world. Uh, he's going to come with about four or 5,000, depending on which source you read, Union cavalry, all on horseback. And they're going to come uh, and visit Martinsville as part of one of the longest raids of the Civil War that you've probably really never heard much about. These are the men in command. George Stoneman is in command of the overall expedition. He was a West Point graduate and a roommate of Stonewall Jackson for one year. I'm trying to imagine those two as college guys. That would have been fun. Uh, his division is commanded by a man named Alvin Gillum, who is a Southerner who stayed loyal to the Union. And under Gillum is uh, William Jackson Palmer. Palmer is almost the youngest Union general in the entire war. Only one man was younger when he became a general, and that was George Custer. So that's who Palmer is. He had been born a Quaker in Delaware, and he grew up mostly in Philadelphia. Before the war, he worked railroads, and after the war, he's going to work railroads. How old was he? He was in his late 20s when he comes to visit. <coughs> They're under the command of George Thomas, who is a uh, centered mainly in Tennessee and Nashville, the Rock of Chickamauga, who himself is a Virginian who had stayed loyal to the Union. He is under the command of Ulysses S. Grant, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, and President Abraham Lincoln. Just to show you how the Union hierarchy worked in 1865. George Thomas is an interesting fellow. He was almost killed during, uh, I believe, Nat Turner's Rebellion. He was a young man growing up out there in Southside Virginia. And uh, Nat Turner, when he uh, did his uh, slave <coughs> uprising, came very close to George Thomas's home, and uh, he could have very easily been killed. Stoneman's raid uh, 
leaves Knoxville at the end of March. They're going to travel over the mountains to Boone, North Carolina. They're going to get on the Yadkin River and come uh, east on the Yadkin. They're going to get to what we call Rockford, North Carolina, and there they're going to uh, turn north. One of the reasons he does this, I think, is they're really wanting Salisbury, North Carolina, because Salisbury was a big prison, a big storehouse for the Confederate Army, so if they're trying to kind of throw the Confederates off, so he turns and comes north, and he's going to come up through Mount Airy, and they're going to go back into Virginia and get all the way to Christiansburg. They're going to turn around to Christiansburg after they do some uh, urban renewal on the railroads and come back down through Patrick County. Uh, it wasn't Stewart then, it was Taylorsville or uh, Patrick Courthouse. Uh, and so this is how the raid begins with our friend George Stoneman. There's three brigades. Palmer commands one. Here's the other brigade. You'll notice these men are Kentucky and Michigan. They are men who are Southerners in their temperament, but they've stayed loyal to the Union. Commanded by uh, Simeon Brown here. The other brigade is commanded by John K. Miller. And these are Tennesseans who have stayed loyal to the Union. And one of the things I want to impress upon you is these Southerners who have stayed loyal to the Union, they have a little agenda. And it's to make their Southern brethren pay for what they've done in this war. And uh, I was telling Steve earlier, if John K. Miller had come to Martinsville on April the 8th, 1865, I don't think Debbie and Virginia and Mervyn would have a courthouse museum. <laughs> I don't think they'd have a courthouse. At least not in the form it is today. When you attack Miller or Brown, uh, they tend to do a little urban renewal. Uh, they start fires and burn your town down, things like that. But luckily for Martinsville, that's not who comes. By some mistake, Palmer, who has been uh, in Christiansburg and comes back, takes his brigade, and you saw they're Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and turns and comes to Martinsville. And they're going to start coming in early, early in the morning of April the 8th. 1865. Palmer is not going to really be here for this battle, but his men will start filtering in, and what they do all day is slowly make their way into Henry County. Here's Luther S. Trowbridge, a Michigan man, graduate of Yale. He is in command of the first troops who come into Henry County. And they're out there, I guess, what we would call uh, outward Bassett Forks, uh, rough and ready meal. And he's going to uh, send some of his men at the 10th Michigan in. And this is what our buddy Chris Hartley uh, uh, says about all this. Chris, of course, has written a great book about the uh, Stoneman's Raid, 1865, and it's probably going to be the definitive book for years. Chris says, and this will begin the biggest fight Henry County ever saw. Trowbridge is going to send his men into town, uh, and the man he sends in is this gentleman, Frederick Field, 10th Michigan. Now, Field and uh, Trowbridge don't like each other very much. Uh, with anything, there's a lot of politics involved with armies. Uh, Field, I think, felt like his men always got the bad duty, and so it's he that's going to lead his men from Rough and Ready Mill into Martinsville, looking for the rebels. It's April the 8th, 1865. Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia has exactly one day to live. They're up at Appomattox, and the next day, of course, is April the 9th, 1865, and Robert E. Lee will surrender. None of this is known to any of the men who are fighting here in Martinsville on this day. Uh, something else to remember, we're in Martinsville, we're going to have a thousand Yankee cavalry, we'll call them Yankees. Uh, over at Danville is the president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis. None of these men know that. Jefferson Davis is kind of aware of them, but I don't think they're really aware of him. So imagine a thousand Union cavalry, what they could do to Danville if they decided to go that direction after a big prize. But they don't know that. And for Jefferson Davis's sake, he has, uh, oh, another month and two days before they're going to catch him. So 
So Frederick Field and his men are to trot into Martinsville. They're going to come over here. I think they'll come right up by the courthouse. And they really don't encounter anybody. I think the way we've always heard this is that they encountered them on Jones Creek. And I'm not sure if that's really what happens anymore. I've, I've started to rethink how I feel about all of this. Because they get all the way to here and haven't encountered any Confederates yet. They're going to move out to the east toward Danville. And there they are going to encounter some Confederates. They're going to find some men under uh, James T. Wheeler, who is the cousin of Fighting Joe Wheeler, who is a very famous Confederate cavalryman. But this is James T. Wheeler. He has one regiment, probably about 500 men. Now, when they first start to fight here, uh, they're going to be fairly even, number-wise. But as this day progresses, what's going to happen is more and more Union cavalry are going to come. And by the end of the day, Palmer's going to have a thousand men. He's going to have a thousand men with repeating rifles. Now, that's a whole different animal than what the Confederates are fighting with. These men have repeating rifles. The Union Army uh, has implemented this. Uh, Custer's men, for instance, have these. And it makes a whole bit of difference when you're fighting to have a repeating weapon versus you know, one you've got to put the powder in and ram it in and all that. So that's what the Confederates are up against this day. The man who first encounters Confederates is this gentleman. Uh, Captain James Cummins of the 10th Michigan. He uh, <coughs> uh, looks off in the distance and sees uh, quite a bit of Confederates and takes his men and runs right after them. The thing Cummins uh, doesn't uh, realize is that at this point he's really kind of outnumbered. But uh, that will quickly change for him as the day goes on. Uh, there's all sorts of stories about this. There's some very funny ones. One story uh, about this, I'll show you a little picture of the old courthouse in downtown with Palmer and Field and Trowbridge. But Cummins finds himself in the middle of this fight with the Confederates. The Confederates apparently are down in kind of a low depression, somewhere east of town here, I believe. And uh, they open up on the Yankees and the fight begins. And uh, Cummins realizes that he's a little bit outnumbered. Well, he actually, at one point in this battle, or skirmish, will actually put himself where a tree is to his side, and he will stand there, and bullets going all around him, and the tree protects him. Wheeler and his uh, four or 500 men uh, <coughs> are under the command of PGT Beauregard, who had been the hero of uh, Fort Sumter, had fought at first Manassas, but now he finds himself in command of this part of North Carolina and Virginia. Joseph Johnson is grappling, of course, with William Sherman a little bit to the east, Robert E. Lee is to the north, and Beauregard finds himself being outwitted by George Stone because he can't really figure out where he is. Well, suddenly, we, they know where they are. They're in Martinsville. And I'm going to read just a little bit about this uh, from my book, and it goes like this. At 7 a.m., Company D of the 10th Michigan tried to slow before slamming into the Confederate camp. Surprise and confusion ruled supreme at this moment. Field ordered his men to charge, but they balked. At this moment, Lieutenant Kenyon, holding a saber and with several of his men, <laughs> rode to the front to assist Field and fell dead with two of his men making Kenyon the highest-ranking Union officer to perish in Martinsville. Field now faced Wheeler with about a dozen men. Cut off, Field's spears were coming true. He prepared to surrender after firing and killing two of Wheeler's command. He was behind a tree on his horse when the tree got the worst of the fire. At this point, his men rallied and formed a line of battle. Field was shot in the elbow, causing him to dismount and fall behind the tree in excruciating pain. His men forced the Confederates back who took his weapons, leaving him still standing beside the tree that saved his life. The firing lulled as the Yankee ammunition began to run out. At this moment, as if out of a John Wayne movie, the Confederates let out one of those last rebel yells of the war and began to charge. At this moment, Field and his men heard the sound of Spencer repeating <coughs> rifles, 
and knew that Trowbridge was up with the rest of the 10th Michigan. Trowbridge wrote, I do not know that I ever found the time when it was exactly pleasant to come unexpectedly upon a superior force of the enemy, but if there was a time which was more unpleasant than another, it was the early morning after a continuous march of 24 hours when men and horses were thoroughly fatigued. The Confederates began to retreat. Field wrote, at this change in the program, my heart jumped right into my mouth and the excitement of the moment I jumped onto my feet and staggered into the middle of the road by the assistance of my horse, which had stood by me. He, of course, is unarmed. Two captains, Cummins and Dunn, drove the rebels back. On the account of the 10th Michigan States, Captain James H. Cummings, commanding the leading battalion, immediately charged and routed the party in the town and drove them back on the main body. The noise of the firing aroused the main body, which quickly saddled and formed, and when Cummings reached them, they were in line of battle. Nothing could restrain the 10th Michigan, however, they attacked with vigor and the enemy was driven out of the woods. They mainly took refuge in a deep depression, so common in the south, and there huddled together. They formed an excellent target for the Spencer repeating rifles and his plucky boys, Captain Dunn. The casualties of the enemy were reported as many as 27 killed. The result on the Union side was five killed, including Lieutenant Kenyon, a quote, noble young man. The 10th Michigan reported that four others were killed, George Wood, Sergeant John Benton, Joseph Kuhn, and Ira Harvey, with three wounded. One of these was Lieutenant Field, James Spencer, and an unnamed soldier. One man was also missing. Also lost were four horses and four sets of arms and accoutrements. The dead rested for many years uh, in the old Episcopal church, which, if somebody correct me, I believe is about where the farmer's market is today. That's number eight on that map on the bottom left corner. Good eyes, Debbie Hill. They're going to move them over to Danville, to the National Cemetery. This is the Union Dad I'm talking about. And only today, only Lieutenant Thomas G. Kenyon is uh, buried over there in Section L. The Federals uh, tried to make a makeshift hospital, which was possibly the Henry County Courthouse, or the square around the building. Field reported that Colonel Trowbridge and Major John Standish of the 10th Michigan visited the wounded, but not, did not speak to the men. He felt, Field felt his superiors should be ashamed of themselves for ordering such a dangerous charge without proper intelligence on the position of the Confederate forces. James D. Wheeler, the commander of the Confederates, wrote on April 12th, 12 miles east of Henry Courthouse, that the enemy attacked me at 7 a.m. today after a spirited fight were repulsed with severe loss on their side. The force that attacked me was 800 strong, he wrote. Wheeler reported the loss of one man and several wounded, but the Yankees reported many more casualties on the southern side. And one thing if you ever read Civil War official reports is you should always take a grain of salt with you because no officer, or very seldom do you see a real uh, high-ranking officer is ever going to say, uh, I got whooped today in Martinsville. He's always going to act like he won the battle, uh, or at least most of them will do that. Wheeler fell back towards Danville, protecting the Confederate government and residents there, and quickly realized Palmer's force was about three times his size, and indicated, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Palmer, excuse me, arrived later that day, and took up his headquarters in which would have been, I guess, our dear friend John Red Smith's uh, grandfather's house. I believe that's right. Uh, which is, that, is, is that the location where um, Town Hall is today? Okay. Town Hall is today. Uh, Palmer, as usual, uh, was polite, but John Red Smith's grandmother told him, quote, that he, she found his presence in her home to be very obnoxious. <laughs> Palmer uh, is going to leave Martinsville on the day of April the 9th, 1865. They're going to move toward Danbury. He's going to uh, not burn the town down. Uh, and this is about the only time in Stoneman's Raid that I really can remember where they were, uh, the Union force was attacked that they didn't do a little urban renewal. In Boone, for instance, they were attacked and they set fire to many buildings in the town of Boone, North Carolina. Uh, 